Hello, everyone. Okay, it's wonderful to see everyone here. Hello. Welcome here, Galadad. We have several people joining us here, and I know many of you are joining us online. My name is Hillary Mayhew, and I'm the coordinator here for the Gallaudet G-U-R-I-E-C. The title of that is actually Gallaudet University Regional Interpreter Education Center. Specifically, we serve 14 states, but we, um, along with five other centers, all belong to the National Consortium of Interpreter Education Centers, the NCIEC. And the goal of this is to support interpreters who are out there working, teachers, deaf and hearing consumers, and the wider community in trying to elevate information and knowledge. There are many specialty areas that we work with. One is developing curriculum. We provide trainings. We're involved with research, research and many other avenues. We have a specialty in legal interpreting, medical interpreting, trilingual interpreting, which is Spanish, English, and ASL. And actually, my employer, Beverly, Beverly Holra, is the director. She's not here today, sends her regards, but she's actually involved with a very special initiative now. It's involving in training in the use with trilingual interpreting a new curriculum. So she'll be watching it online, and hello to Bev. So I'm thrilled today to have with us this wonderful group. We're going to be talking about another specialty, specialty, which is mentoring. Great group. Very excited to have everyone here with me. Originally, this group started out with eight members, but we know that everybody, they're all successful interpreters now, are busy. We were able to get six of them to come back and join us today. So thank each and every one of you. Thank they're you. to share some of the information they have, what they've learned from that experience, and be able to pass this on to all of you. Some of you might be interested in setting up your own peer mentoring groups. So we're hoping that this idea spreads. I'm going to turn it over to everyone. Before I do that, there are a couple of details and instructions I want to cover. If any of you are interested in getting CEUs, or Certificate of Completion for today, there's two things you have to do. You have to have taken the pre-assessment and the post-assessment. Hopefully you've finished that pre-assessment when you actually registered for the course today. But at the end of the event today, we're asking you to go back and finish the post-assessment. And this isn't only for those of you who are actually seeking CEUs, but we're asking everyone if you wouldn't mind to do that. It's helpful for us. We really value the feedback that we get from each and every one of you. It helps us to improve our programs. So let me show you quickly what to do if you want the slides from today. This is how you download them. And if you actually haven't filled out the online information or done the pre-assessment, please do it now. Go ahead and click above what you see. You'll see the link up there. This is what you'd click on. So we're going to take about an hour, maybe an hour and 20 minutes, have discussion and some words from our panelists, and then we'll be opening this up to question and answers. So you can do that. Those of us here in our audience have that opportunity as well as those of online. Let me show you what to do if you'd like to send in a question. And if you're unclear, I also sent you an email this morning so you should have the information and the instructions in that email. So we're very excited to start, and I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. She is Naisha Washington Shepherd. She's actually a perfect moderator for this discussion. She's a recent graduate from the Gallaudet Interpreting Mentoring Program. And she's always been enthusiastic to learn and improve and grow with her own professional development. She's got a background in biology as well. She's the recent president of DC ADBC here in the local area, the Black Deaf Advocates Association. We're really proud of that. And we're just thrilled to have you, Naisha. Thank you so much, Hillary. 
And thank each and every one of you all for coming today, as well as all of those that are live streaming and watching us remotely. We're excited to have a distinguished panel of guests here today who have set up their own mentoring organization, and they're going to talk with us about that today. As a mentor myself, I learned a lot about mentoring, and today being able to moderate the panel and to ask questions about it has been great for me because I've had an opportunity to really dig into something I wanted to know more about. The name of the organization is True Biz. Do any of you all have signs for True Biz? Not the panelists, but let me see what you all are signing out in the audience. Okay, you're signing it that way, and this way, and that way. Any other signs for it? True Biz? Ah, okay, interesting. Wonderful. Any other ideas? Let's check with the panelists. Which one would you like to sign? This is how we sign it. True yes. Biz. Just like this, yes. Okay, True Business. True Business has come to be the name of this organization. And it was established back in 2000. And each of the interpreters that have been involved with the organization have become very, very, very successful. And they count mentoring as a part of that process. Yes, yes. Because each of them have, as a result of their participation, become certified. So as we start, I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves and share where they are currently working. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Fulami Ford. I'm a full-time staff interpreter here at Gallaudet University. Hello, I'm Pam Collins. I'm a full-time interpreter and I work also part-time teaching and I'm a full-time student as well. Hello everyone, my name is Janine Radcliffe and I'm a freelance interpreter. Hi, I'm Nicole Schamburger, and I'm a full-time interpreter and a graduate student as well. Hello, I'm Tiffany Hill, and I work as a full-time freelance interpreter. Hello, everyone. I'm Katrina Street. And I'm a part-time freelance interpreter here at Gallaudet. Wonderful. Thank you. And I have to tell you, <laughs> having an opportunity to watch the fingerspelling reminds me of the bravery it takes sometimes um, to interpret that. So you all set up your organization, and I'm sure many members of the audience want to know lots of details about it. So I hope you're ready for me to question you. My first question for you is, what exactly is TrueBiz, and, and what does it mean to you? Um, it was It's a really interesting question. It just so happened that all of us had gone through an interpreter training program and we had graduated from that program and we all were hired by a, a an interpreter referral agency known as Sign Language Associates, or SLA, and we were working interpreters and it was a wonderful agency to work um, with. They provide us with general training that we needed that was um, truly wonderful. But as time passed, we kind of felt as if we needed something more. Um, it was great to have that generalized training, but we needed some more specific training to focus in on specific skill building and improvement. And that's when we decided to form the group. So if you wouldn't mind following up on that question, how did you come up with the name of True Biz? Um, to be honest with you, um, I would have to hand that over to um, Janine. She was the creative baby in our group. Well, that was such a long time ago. Honestly, I don't know that I remember um, it is true that we were very authentic with each other, all of us. 
And so when we thought about a name, we wanted something that would represent that quality. And to us, that's what this sign means, you know, true viz. It really means something that's real, that's who we were. And so that's how. Agreed. Beautiful. Beautiful. Why, thank you. Outstanding. So as you came together, how did you go about selecting the members that became a part of your group? How did you make those choices? We didn't randomly select members of our group. We felt that it was very important for us um, to truly assess and find people who would be appropriate um, matches for for our group. Who would be appropriate match? Who would be an appropriate match for our group? Um, so didn't, we didn't do any type of random selecting. We wanted to find people who were of a similar mindset. Um, all of us were very assertive and highly motivated, and it just so happened that we were able to create a bond and establish our group known as True Biz. Also, keep in mind in terms of structure, how we establish the structure, and we had to feel as though the structure, the people, the time, and all of that, all of it worked together. It was really organic almost a perfect storm if you think of it. So it wasn't that we necessarily decided it, but it was an organic experience that we created and took advantage of. And we first got started, our goal for all of us was to become certified, but we also wanted to be responsible for supporting other members of the community and passing on the knowledge that we were gaining in the concept of each one teach one. So there's always a line of people. We are following people and they're those that are following us. And We took that very seriously as part of what it was we were about. I would like to add that when our group was formed, um, we were able to really take off and um, it became well known within the community and people started reaching out to us and wanting to join. And that was really unexpected and cool at the same time. At that point, again, we didn't decide that we were just going to open the doors and allow you know everyone to flood in. We wanted to again assess and decide who would be a best match to become a member of our organization. And so becoming a member was by invitation. Thank you. And let's move on to our next question. This mic isn't working. Why was it important to have peer mentoring? Why was that an important piece of your concept? What was important about that for you? It's a very important component um, because all of us had similar goals and we all wanted to achieve the same goal. We, um, something, this is something we had consensus on. Um, but as Katrina mentioned, we all were working within the same agency, SLA, and it just so happened that we would end up being at work in work on a daily basis, and we were also assigned a mentor by the agency that would work with us. But that would happen during the workday from 9 to 5, which means that after 5 o'clock, um, we would be, you know, without that practice and that ability to be able to do skill building. So us being able to have a peer mentor was something we were able to work with together to help um, basically pull each other up and improve each other's skills. That's right. And you just mentioned that, that you know, we work 9 to 5 and we had a mentor assigned to us, which was really nice. But the fact that we could get together at other times, evenings or weekends, was really a nice benefit of this. And would you mind if I add to that? Also, SLA's mentoring program is not in existence anymore. But SLA's mentoring program had been established for over 20 years. And understand that it was set up for people who were required to have internships as part of their interpreter training programs, as many of us had. And we were involved in the program for three months. And you could sign up for it for two consecutive sessions of a total of six months. But at the end of that, we felt that we needed more and we wanted to grow and continue to improve our skills. 
And so it wasn't just being mentored for the time, the six months that we were in the official program, but then the nine to five, we were thinking about what's next for me. And so that's part of how we came about setting up True Biz. And we had these shared, agreed upon goals. Um, Of course, we wanted to reach a certain level of um, expertise and skill, but we wanted more from mentoring. We wanted to be able to create the camaraderie, an environment where we could learn toward each other. And we have these shared goals. We didn't want to be mediocre interpreters. We wanted to be, um, you know, high quality interpreters of the top level. Yes. And we were willing to put the work in for that as well. Right. We were absolutely willing to put the work in, to, to work and strive for that. We were committed. Even after 5 o'clock, we were committed. We worked on vocabulary. We had different information we'd be studying or we'd be talking about things. So we were accountable for different parts of this. You know, maybe others went home and went to sleep. Not us. We were working. Yes, we were working hard. Would you mind if I add to that as well? The significance of a peer mentoring group is that there are a formal, a few formal peer programs that are set up, and there are limited options for those. And uh, the opportunity to be able to work with each other and to associate with each other and support each other was very important. I'll hold my comment until afterwards. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question. It seems that you've touched on it just a bit, but the next question How did you all benefit from being members of TrueBiz? Can you share about the benefits to you? I don't mind starting um, answering that question as far as the benefits of being a part of the program. Um, There were definite benefits to your participation. First of all, you notice that we are all women. In addition to that, we are all women of color. And therefore, um, as in women of color, we would face other challenges that other colleagues would not face. Um, we can remember the specific moment when we were, um, you know, Pam would take me aside and be like, come here, come here, I need to talk to you, come here. And I wouldn't understand, and I would be looking around all paranoid and um, wondering. And after Pam would sit down with me and talk to me about, you know, the history and share some of the knowledge and expertise, expertise in order to help me understand what that big picture was. And so the next time I would face a challenge or a situation, I would understand how to handle myself. Um, so that type of um, peer mentoring and support Support, obviously involving skill building and working on our actual interpreting skills, but we also had the professional side of things. Yes, and I think another benefit um, for all of us to come together as peers is just the comfort level. You know, often when you're working with the typical traditional mentor, that sometimes there's different status of the two people involved. Sometimes there's that hierarchy that's set up and you're not as comfortable as you might be with your peer. We all have anxiety. It all makes us stumble sometimes in our work. But when you're with your colleagues and when you're with your peers, you have that comfort level. So for me, the idea of a mentor, I think we shouldn't think of it as a traditional way, but more as mentoring involves education. People are educators. Each and every one of us can be educators. You might not think of it as mentor, but if you think about it as educators, that helps to just bring down the you know, to the comfort level, and then you can all focus on professional development. If I may briefly add to that, if you read some of the literature and articles related to mentoring, it typically talks about mental and psychological support, but that is another aspect of mentorship. So being able to express the challenges that we faced and having an opportunity to talk about that with each other, that's another uh, piece of our exchange as peer mentors that we were able to take advantage of. In addition to that, In addition to that, you mentioned the benefits of TrueBiz. So these were not only personal benefits to us, but it's beneficial to the field, beneficial to hearing and deaf consumers alike. Um, When we go to our job and assignments, we want qualified and skilled interpreters um, to be able to handle whatever happens. So yes, it was beneficial to us, but it is beneficial to the consumers because as I go out and do my work, because I'm educated and I'm a a, a skilled and qualified interpreter, um, I would benefit the community. So it benefited both the deaf and hearing consumers as well. 
and often I'm just, you know, I agree with all of my colleagues up here, but often the whole, the focus on the holistic, the whole interpreter sometimes get lost. You know, you might be working on one specific area or some terminology or something. You can't really forget the fact that you have to look at the interpreter as a whole. Thank you. So for our next question, we're going to talk a bit more about just the deaf interpreter. Do you see that there would be a benefit for deaf interpreters? Yes, definitely. Um, the six of us were just having a conversation about the benefits of having um, deaf interpreters. I mean, interpreters are interpreters, um, no matter where, what our hearing level or status is. Um, so for us, to, for deaf interpreters to be able to establish a group um, to provide mentoring, networking, and helping um, each other to polish their skills and improve, and also to be able to trust each other uh, as well. So imagine to have um, a different interpreter that you can be able to work with, but also have a hearing interpreter as a, as a peer mentor. Um, that would definitely be mutually beneficial. That's right. And the fact that we were all similar, um, African-American women members of TrueBiz, we now you know, have shared this, and now we're moving on and sharing our model with others. Naomi of DC has hosted workshops where they're bringing in new interpreters and deaf interpreters. And I think, Naisha, you were involved in that. Yes, I was. Um, that particular workshop, 45 deaf interpreters came talking about how you can all support each other, how you can work together, whether you form smaller associations or making it a larger group. There's definitely a benefit so for both hearing and deaf interpreters. I absolutely agree with you and the benefits to the deaf community as well as to deaf interpreters to work with a smaller group of colleagues to be able to grow and develop. It's very helpful to have a vision of what to do and I do hope that deaf interpreters will see this presentation. I'm talking to you who are out there and create an organization like this. Yes. I noticed um, one aspect that was particularly fascinating is the way that um, you know deaf interpreters um, interpret and the way that they go about doing their job is quite different um, from the way that we do and being able to really have a deaf consumer connect with a deaf interpreter and how that happens. Um, so definitely we need to be reaching out to RID and other organizations so that they can set out um, set up standards for that. But at the same time, um, we need to be able to have those seasoned deaf interpreters allow us and consult with us. I see so many times the work that deaf interpreters do, and I really can't reach the consumer the way that a deaf interpreter can. And sometimes we um, work in a silo, but really being able to work with deaf interpreters is um, particularly um, great, and that's a great collaboration. <laughs> I can absolutely say amen to that, and I see the benefit of each group of interpreters, hearing interpreters and deaf interpreters, supporting each other and working together. So I'm going to move on to the next question. There are two words that are typically used as we have this conversation. One is mentorship, and the other one is apprenticeship. So how are those words distinguished? Can you share with me how you think of those being different? The traditional view of the, or the traditional model is that of the older wise person imparting knowledge to the young naive um, mentee um, who is um, you know, a receptacle receiving all of this information. However, the peer mentor model is quite different. Um, we are allowing um, ourselves to have uh, used the power, access, and experiences of the mentor in order to decrease the risk of career failure um, for the mentees. Obviously, we all want to become successful, and we need other people to help us in our path to success. Therefore, um, we can utilize our knowledge and our experience um, to give that to another person um, so that we can allow that person to also be brought up and, and improve in their skills. And I'm going to add to that as well. You know, often people tend to think of mentoring um, in this 
it's it's a fallacy in a sense. You know, you have this fairy godmother who's just going to float on in, wave their magic wand, and with all of that magic, blink of an eye, overnight, you will gain that knowledge. It's, that's not the way people acquire their skill. That's definitely a fallacy. I like to think of it better as this type of metaphor, and there's three of those, almost as if using a mirror to really take a look, do that inventory of yourself, to think about, as an individual, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, you know, what you can work on, and that's something that you would bring to the group, and that's what we did. We brought and shared with each other as a true biz. We talked about these. Another idea, another met- metaphor, is thinking of a baseball team. I have to first tell you I'm not a baseball expert. That's not anything for me. And I don't even watch any sport, actually. But I'm going to still use this metaphor. So think of a baseball team. Individual players have their individual roles. And they have their roles and responsibilities that go with that position. Right? Each of them are bringing something to the table and to the team. The third analogy I want to talk about is thinking about a temp organization. organization or a temp agency. You might want to bring people in because of specific knowledge that they have on a temporary basis, just like any temp agency does. So you're not asking for a commitment that's going to last you know, for years and years. You're only asking maybe on a short-term basis for a particular skill to come in and to share it. And then they're done. You give them your thanks, and they're done. So you need to set realistic goals, first of all, what can be achieved on a temporary basis, and you're going to work towards that goal and hopefully achieve it. So, did we get everything from our mentors? Do we need everything in our peer mentorship experience? Well, obviously that would be impossible. So I would say no, because that would be impossible. You're not going to depend on any mentor for anything impossible. They, they can't give you anything. Obviously, we're all diverse. We all have our own individual experiences that we bring to something. So knowing that, you would bring in different people at different times with individual knowledge and expertise. And that's what we did. We would reach out to others for their experiences, sharing their strengths and weaknesses, You know, even thinking of a perfect world, it's not as if someone will know everything. So that shouldn't be the expectation. That was a great answer. Those were really um, a lot of good information that was there. And about being able to support each other and uh, strive and achieve the goals that it is that you were working on. So for the next question... For our audience, what are the keys that you would share with them about establishing a peer mentorship group? The key components that you think are critical. So obviously there's a whole list of what I think that they could include. I'm just going to pick out three right now. One is permission. You know, you're vulnerable. You're allowing others to take a look at you and give you feedback. You're talking about strengths and weaknesses, so there's that vulnerability. So you have to think about permission that you're allowing each of the peer mentors to have. The second has to do with accountability. Each and every one of us would be accountable. We're accountable for our work. We're going to be accountable towards each other. We're learning from each other, and we're going to be working together. And then we had that commitment, so we're going to plan our meetings, and then we're committed to come. We didn't want someone who would think, you know, from any time to time that they didn't need to show up. For us, it was a commitment, and we expected all of us to be there so that we could work together. And the other third one is authenticity. You know, we were having these candid discussions with each other. Maybe I was practicing something in front of someone else, making several mistakes. Here I am vulnerable to have someone talk about. I needed to feel comfortable um, to talk so that I could try to strive. I can remember t- an example I want to share with you, but when we all came together and we were doing this practice, we were talking about particular skill at that point, it was voicing, and we were working with a video. At that time, we are using VHS. This is dating us. Yes, you know, remember, we're talking about, about 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. So yep, we were, we're using old. a VHS. 
And at that point, two of us were actually working as the interpreting. The other members were watching us work. And we were working specifically on our voicing skills, taking turns, and trying to do the best we could. But obviously, we made some mistakes. There were some problems with comprehension. But again, we were practicing what we could. And I remember at the end, we asked each other how we felt. And I remember saying, I didn't feel so good about it. I'm a horrible interpreter. But what I heard from everybody else is, no, that's not the case. I needed to think about what was it that I was missing, maybe fingerspelling. But I got ideas from my other colleagues that I needed to think about what was being said before and maybe what was being said after, you know, to try to use closed skills and to think about what was happening there. And that was a great piece of information that helped me. I don't have to feel as if I'm just overwhelmed or lost, but I can work with it. And from there, I was able to grow. Yes, and I tr truly felt that that supportive environment was there because of the mentoring experience. Um, you were able to make um, real-world application. Um, several of us were able to work together because we were at SLA and we were assigned at the same jobs. And so we were able to provide that support on the job. And we were able to carry over those skills from the mentoring sessions. I want to add one other comment. <coughs> I remember and Tiffany and I actually were working together and I remember being very nervous or she was very nervous at one time but knowing that we were teaming together just helped in terms of comfort. That was very nice to have developed that, that comfort. That's nice because sometimes when you find out who your team is going to be and you have a previous experience that has been good with that person, it can make all the difference in having a successful assignment. So now, if we go to our next question, if our watchers or the people who are visiting with us are thinking about establishing in a group, what are the things that make the most effective collaboration for them to work together? What kinds of things would you encourage them to include? Um, as was mentioned, there are key components, and one of those key components, um, in my opinion, is communication. Um, that is of vital importance. Um, when you're in the group, everyone needs to decide to be able to show up, yes. So you show up at the group, but you need to have some type of agenda set um, as to what, how you're going to proceed, what the goals of the group are, and coming to an agreement on that, being able to make an, an honest assessment of your skills, and I like to emphasize honest, and being able to um, provide and receive feedback in order to um, make the improvements required and also have a starting point um, and start be able to evaluate your process and be able to see your improvements or your digression progress or, or if you're not making progress and be able to really hone in on working on specific skills that you need to improve on. I really feel that communication is key, being able to express what it is that you need to work on um, before even um, becoming a member or joining a group. If I may add to that, if you all are thinking about setting up your own kind of group, there are six different questions that you want to think about. The 5W and 1H, are you familiar with that model? Do you all know that model? Okay, let me say that to you. The first one is who. Who is going to be in the group with you? Deciding who is going to be in the group, you can think about it. And But I would not just randomly pick people. Think about it seriously because as many as 20 years later, you may be friends with these people. For example, we're still friends. And if we had picked wrong, it could have not been a good thing. So make sure you pick good people. Next, another question is what? So it means when you come together to study, you don't want to just uh, have in in un unidentified goals. You want to think through it and be very specific about what it is that you want to do. You want to practice for an exam or get certified or work on a particular skill. And for hearing interpreters, it's a good idea to invite and very, not only a good idea, but very, very important to have deaf people to come in and collaborate with hearing interpreters in these organizations. The third question is focusing on when. That means you want to be timely. If you have a group 
that's set up, make an appointment. All of our members were involved, and we decided that we were going to work together for a particular period of time, and we suggest that you identify a particular period of time as well. Also, where? More often than not, we met at each other's homes, and we also met at libraries in the free rooms that libraries have and studied together. But now, for you all, the options that you have are completely unlimited because you can meet online, you can use Uvu. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's a wonderful site where you can have more than one person video chatting at the same time. Another way you can meet is via Skype. And imagine if you videotape yourself during your working, during the day, you can then send that out to friends or colleagues for feedback by way of sites like Dropbox or Copy.com. I don't know if you all have heard of that. Have you heard of these two? In particular... Maybe not the last one, copy.com. Copy.com is unlimited and free, which means you can videotape yourself and then send it out to colleagues for feedback very easily. So we also want to focus... That was where, but think about why. That's another W question. We all were very comfortable with each other, and we wanted to study with each other. You want to focus on your needs and have very specific goals. You don't want to have just broad, unidentified, ambiguous goals. And finally, think about your how. You may want to consider creating a mission statement, what it is that you all are agreeing upon. For example, you set up object objectives with each other. And perhaps you also want to create bylaws for your mentoring group. Imagine someone becomes a member of your group and then decides after a while that they don't want to be involved and they drop out. Is the group going to pursue them or allow them to leave? So if you have bylaws established ahead of time, it can help you to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Another how is think about having experts. For example, weekly experts. Sometimes our weekly expert would be one of us, some one of us that has a particular skill or knowledge or expertise. But every week, your group should check in with each other and talk about your progress, your improvement, and what it is that you're doing, what you like, what worked, what it is that you want to include more of. So you may want to think about all of these as you're developing your group. And if you do, you will be successful. That was outstanding. The tips and the information that you gave, talking about having in-house uh, workshops amongst you all as well as having other people come in to work with the group, that's a very great, uh, wonderful idea. And it's nice to think about it because it gives you some variety instead of having it be uh, stagnant or in unspontaneous. It's a lot more fun that way. I, I just recently found a document that I had to shake the dust off of, um, which was actually our mission and vision and vision statements. Um, so I just had a good laugh over it. Um, you know, we were looking at it, I see we were smart. I was impressed by um, Janine and Fulami, who were the ones who um, wrote it. So it was really nice to see um, our history there. That's great. So the next question I have for you, what was the role of the liaison in the peer mentoring group? What was the role of that particular person? So sure, um, we did use liaisons. And to us, these were people who had a lot of knowledge in a particular area. They had, you know, gotten far in their career. And when we, we were meeting monthly, we would often invite different speakers to come in. We'd bring in the li liaisons. Some of them were interpreters who were really stellar interpreters, um, whether they had particular skill in terms of their voicing abilities. But we looked to these people and would invite them in. And I remember one person in particular, Juniper Sussman. She's just an excellent interpreter. 
well renowned for her voicing skills and her ability for that. And we wanted her to come talk with us. And so we had her come almost as if it was a workshop. Another time, um, we'd bring in different professionals. I also remember another experience that I was very scarred from. Still am. <laughs> Still. <laughs> I think I have a VHS of this, but we invited Dr. Raymond Merritt, who at that time worked for the National Institute of Health, Health NIH, which is here in our area in Maryland. And he is a scientist, um, has achieved a lot in biology, and obviously I have had biology in my background, but it wasn't as if I knew that much about biology. Yeah, me either. <laughs> so he asked Dr. Merritt to come talk with us and actually teach us um, on the subject of biology. If he would come present with us so we could practice interpreting, doing voice interpreting. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we videotaped that. So I remember specifically I worked with Pam and we were lost. I know. We did gone. not oh know what gone. he was presenting. I, I, was, got, I typed Janine. I <laughs> got <difficult>. nothing, sis. <laughs> We were looking at her because she looked like she knew she, what she was doing. We didn't. Right. I mean, I think about these experiences that we had. We learned a lot. But we, again, we brought in people who were tops in their field. And knowing that we already had established these goals, that we really wanted to improve our skills, improve, improve our work, we asked them to come, whether it was Raymond or Juniper or others, to come work with us. We worked on our own strengths and weaknesses. We worked amongst ourselves. We were not asking the liaison to help us develop those. That's something that we did as a group. But they would come in and work in their specialty area. So we developed our own structure. That was in place. And then they would come in. Sometimes we'd meet on a Saturday. We would ask these liaisons to come in basically for two hours of their time. Um, if we asked them for extended amount of period, that we wouldn't have had the time. So we didn't ask for that. We might we meet longer. But we only asked people to come in to give us two hours of their time. And that was something that was doable for all these people. So they would come in. They would either present that we could practice our interpreting. We vis we'd videotape it. And at the end, we made sure to always thank our liaisons. Um, we couldn't pay them at an interpreting rate, a certified interpreter's rate. That's not something that we could all do back at that time, but we wanted to at least acknowledge them and make sure we thank them. You know, it could be as simple as giving them a gift certificate to Starbucks or gas, something like that. But we made sure to do that and thank everyone. Each of us, though, took on that role of contacting, reaching out to other liaisons to come in. And often when we asked people, they were really honored just to be asked. They were appreciative of it. So we... That was the feedback that we got. And even with, you know, in particular cases, when we asked Raymond, we then asked him for who else he knew, who was in his network, who else could help us in other fields of science, you know, such as chemistry. <laughs> you know, we made it through the biology lecture, but we worried about chemistry and physics and stuff like that. So we knew that each of these liaisons we brought in also had access to others, and we used that from them as well. Let me just add to that. That comment that Falami made just reminded me of a previous question, was that it showed that our meetings were really planned. We didn't just show up and try to think about what it was we were going to do on any given day. We established goals, and we had agendas that we set up. What was it that we wanted to achieve for the period of time that we were going to be together for those two hours? And we set that up to make sure that we were successful. So at that moment, we started to show ourselves that we had our mentoring process and our collaboration at that point we all became mentors of each other so there really was no authoritative figure within our organization and no hierarchical structure where someone was guiding or directing what we did it just shows that we were involved to work together and we worked as a group and everybody took the lead in that that's a great point that you made about working with the group. So for those people that are watching who may want to become interpreters and may be interested about how to establish mentoring for themselves and inviting people to come in to speak to them, how will they know 
you talked about this idea of mentors typically having more knowledge and being able to ask them questions. And you also talked about you all taking the lead on and being very assertive about going after what it is that you wanted to have and finding the people to fulfill it. So there's some common myths about mentoring and about the interpreting field. Who'd like to talk about those? We've already mentioned a few. Um, as for instance, um, Tiffany just said, we don't have any type of hierarchy. Uh, we are all mentors. Uh, many people feel that the mentor is a one-stop shop, that I walk in empty and I'm going to be able to get everything I need from that mentor in order to reach my goals as if it's a panacea. Or sometimes a mentee walks in and wants to get certified and expect one person to give them everything from A to Z. And that's definitely is not going to happen. It's not realistic. Third, It's not just the idea of um, the mentor um, imparting knowledge. It's actually an exchange of information. Um, that's how the mentoring process should take place. So those are the three myths that I've generally seen. Yeah, I agree. I think often people think that the mentor has to be completely knowledgeable and just have all of this information, but that's not always the case. You know, typically, you know, sometimes people think, you know, I could never be that member mentor. I'm still learning. I'm not ready to do that. But that's not true. No one ever knows everything. So that whole, that whole concept of having to know everything, really, it's an exchange between two people. And I know sometimes you think mentoring has a, has a concrete start and end period. Well, that's not always the case. It can go on for a long time. You know, I've been working interpreting for 15 years and still I'm learning. It's an ongoing process. This is a career that you've all entered. And so you might reach out to one person and you're going to gain a lot of information from them, but there might be others that you can learn from just as well. So don't seek one mentor. You know, look towards what you can take from so many people. There's a lot of skills out there. You have to think about it. What is it that you're looking for? You might say, wow, I admire this in another person. They have that skill. Maybe I can get that from them. You know, something else you might not want to get, but, you know, think about the pieces that you might be able to get and how it's going to help you with your own personal development. Pick what you want and leave what you don't want. Certainly. Absolutely. So the next question... You have touched on a bit, but I'd like to bring it up anyway. Where do you find resources and materials that allow you to go about doing this thing called mentoring? You are so fortunate today to have technology. There are a plethora of resources available to all of you. Um, for example, um, there are, um, if you just Google mentor resources, there are so many results that are going to come up. But um, one in particular, or some in particular that I'd like to suggest are um, Belly Kalonimus. Um, she has certain mentor models that are set. Um, she has specific workshops that she has established, such as Foundations and Aetna. Um, those two um, workshops provide mentoring models that are excellent, um, especially even for seasoned and experienced interpreters. Um, Fulami, I don't know if you'd like to add to that? Sure, thank you. The G-U-R-E-I-C has a toolkit. And I have to tell you, it's really amazing because now technology is unlike what it was at the time that we were working. We had computers and internet, but it wasn't being used to the in the way 